In today's video, we're going to talk about the normal distribution, which is this function right here, whose graph is here. And we're going to dispel three properties of it. One, why the area under the curve is 1, no matter what sigma and mu are. Two, why there's a maximum at mu. And three, why there are inflection points at mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. So stay tuned to this video to find out these properties of the normal distribution. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar. This channel is dedicated to undergraduate theorems and problems for your journey through the undergraduate and to prepare you for the journey beyond. If this is your first time on the channel, definitely subscribe and click the bell for notifications on future videos. And if you're a subscriber already, thanks for coming back. So today we're going to look at this function here, which looks kind of wild. Um, and it's a function in the variable x that has two parameters this constant sigma and this constant mu. And it's an exponential function that decays quite rapidly um, early on and then slowly decays later. This is a function that's used quite ubiquitously in statistics, in particular in areas like the central limit theorem. But a lot of times in uh, mathematics courses, we don't actually understand the mathematical behavior of this function. For example, one fact has to be that the integral under this curve has to be 1 if this is to be modeling a probability distribution. Meaning if this is a probability density function, if you don't know what that is, it's okay, but if it happens to be 1, meaning that it represents a function where when you integrate against it, you get probabilities, then this area has to be 1. Another thing that's often exploited is the fact that this function has a maximum right here at mu and then has inflection points at mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. This helps with some estimates on probabilities. And we're going to prove those two, the fact that this, there's a maximum at mu and inflection points here, together with the area being 1 under the curve in this video. So what I want to do is start by looking at the area under the curve. Okay, so I've placed our function right over here and remember that mu and sigma are constants that are given to us. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is actually compute this integral, which is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of our function. I'll take this constant 1 over uh, mu square root 2 pi outside uh, and then place the function that we have in here right over here. Now, this looks like quite an intense integral to try to compute but well, we can make some observations. The first thing we notice is that you've shifted the argument by mu and then divided by sigma. So you can make a substitution to get rid of all of that stuff. So the substitution we'll make is we'll let y equal x minus mu over sigma. Then dy is uh, dx times 1 over sigma because uh, we have a 1 over sigma factor multiplied by this x. And then a minus mu over sigma is a constant. Okay, so if we do that and substitute, um, notice that as x goes to infinity, y is going to infinity. And as x is going to negative infinity, y is going to negative infinity as well, provided that sigma itself is actually positive. And that's a stipulation that's usually made, that sigma itself is some positive number. Okay, or it could be greater than or equal to zero. Um, but we'll actually, we'll assume that it's greater than zero, because if it's greater than or equal to zero, then uh, we won't have, have an actual curve. Uh, okay, so making that substitution, this integral becomes 1 over sigma root 2 pi times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative 1 half y squared, because y is the substitution we made, dy, right? And dy is sigma, uh, dy times sigma is dx, so we get this. And so this contribution of sigma cancels with this, and we're left with this integral here that is independent of mu and sigma. So that's actually a good clue that we're on the right track, that we've reduced the integral that we're interested in into something that does not depend on mu and sigma, so we hopefully will get some constant. In our case, we want one um, that's fixed no matter what mu and sigma are. So we've reduced to this integral, and so our question is, what is this integral right over here? So we've reduced to this integral, and one of the things that's kind of tricky about it is it's not clear how to integrate this using elementary terms. 
However, there's this really beautiful way to integrate this function, and it involves the following. I'm going to let this thing here be capital I. Okay, then I squared, the product of I with itself, is um, we'll have 1 over root 2 pi multiplied by itself. So we'll get 1 over 2 pi, and then times two copies of this integral. So it's the integral negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative one half y squared dy times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative half x squared dx. Now, what's the advantage of representing the thing we want in terms of its square to do something like this? Well, integrating this with elementary terms is not easy, but because here we have a function dependent only on y and here only on x, we can represent this product as actually a double integral of e to the negative one-half y squared minus one-half x squared dy dx. Now, the reason for doing something like this, and that's the mode, we're going to see that's the motivation for doing this process, is if we factor out the negative half here, we get the quantity x squared plus y squared, which now, if we represent this in terms of polar coordinates, will actually be integratable. So in polar coordinates, we represent points in terms of the radius, we represent points in terms of their distance from the origin and the angle that they make with the x-axis. Um, so the integral turns into an integral in terms of r and theta. Uh, and then y and x are themselves related to y and theta. Here is our value x and here's our value y. Um, so x squared plus y squared is this number r squared. We're taking theta and r over all possible values to go over the entire uh, two-dimensional plane. So r is going from 0 to infinity, and pi is, or theta is going from 0 to 2 pi, um, the entire way around. And then we have the quantity e to the negative 1 half r squared. And the reason why this is going to be integ integratable now is because um, the area element is going to be r dr d theta. That's the transfer from rectangular coordinates to uh, polar coordinates. And now this thing here we can actually integrate because we have this factor r here, which looks close to the derivative of the exponent that we're dealing with. Okay, so I'm going to clear all this um, interesting computation that we just did and write down that i squared is this integral that we want to compute here and then actually figure out what that integral is. Okay, so by our transfer to polar coordinates, i squared is this integral right over here. And notice this thing here is independent of theta. So we can break this up into the product of two integrals as well. This is 1 over 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta times the integral from 0 to infinity of r times e to the negative half r squared dr. Okay, um, so here we actually have a way to integrate this, this piece right over here. This is the evaluation from 0 to infinity of whatever the integral of this is. And notice the derivative of the exponent is negative r. So we would get negative e to the negative half r squared as our actual um, antiderivative for this piece right over here, evaluating from 0 to infinity. Then we have 1 over 2 pi times this, and this is the constant 1, so the area is the length of this interval, which is, or the integral is the length of this interval, which is 2 pi. Okay, here, when we plug in um, 0, we get 1, um, and we plug in infinity, uh, this goes to negative infinity, so it goes to zero. So this quantity is zero minus uh, negative one, which is one. So we get one for this piece, two pi, one over two pi, which gives us that the square of this integral is one, and hence the integral itself is one.
So this is really actually quite interesting that noticing uh, multiplying this integral by itself gives us this e to the x squared plus y squared times the constant allows us to shift to an, uh, a different coordinate system that allows us to integrate readily. Okay, so great. So now we know that the normal distribution definitely does have an integral of 1 from uh, in this entire range from negative infinity to infinity, regardless of what mu and sigma are. Okay, so let's check the other thing, that mu is actually where our maximum is, and inflection points are at mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. So maxima, minima, and inflection points are obtained by analyzing the derivative of a function. So we need to differentiate this thing right over here. Now, the actual constant outside of here is not going to make a difference. So what I'll do is I'll introduce a function, g of x, which is sigma root 2 pi times f of x, right? And so because g is a constant multiple times f, um, then whatever we have zeros of the derivative and zeros of the second derivative and regions where this is positive and negative, the same thing will happen for f because this sigma is a positive constant. So we'll look at g instead because it's more manageable to deal with. All right, so the first thing you want to do is actually take the derivative of g g is this function right over here. Okay, so what we have is e to a function, so the derivative is going to be the derivative of the exponent times e to the function. So we'll have an e to the negative half x minus mu over sigma all squared up here, um, and then we want to multiply by the derivative of the exponent. Okay, so the derivative of the exponent is Bringing this down, we got negative x minus mu over sigma. And then we need to take a chain rule and take the derivative of this inside part, um, which is 1 over sigma. Okay, so the derivative is negative x minus mu all over sigma squared. And so if you want to set this to 0, I'm going to write this down over here. g prime of x equals 0. Well, this is never 0 because it's... Uh, e to some power, and so if you want this to be zero, you have to have this part be zero, um, and that happens when this numerator is zero, and that happens when x is mu. So we have a critical point at mu, but we need to analyze what kind of critical point it actually is, um, whether or not it's a local minimum or a local maximum. Um, in our perception, this thing is actually a local maximum, um, but let's actually figure that out by now taking a second derivative. Okay, so to take a second derivative, we need to use the product rule. Um, so we'll have the derivative of this quantity, which is, because this is a linear thing in x, we'll just get the coefficient beside x, which is negative 1 over sigma squared. So we'll have that times the exponential. Right, and then we're going to add in the derivative of this times this quantity. Okay, but we already knew that the derivative of this had this kind of expression here involved when differentiating. So what we'll get is the contribution of, if you think about this, we'll get this derivative of this thing, which was already this thing right over here, multiplied by this times e to the this. So we'll get the contribution of this thing actually squared. So we get x minus mu squared over sigma to the fourth uh, times e to the negative one-half x minus mu over sigma all squared. And then we'll factor this, we get e to the negative half x minus mu over sigma all squared times this quantity right here, which is negative one over sigma squared plus x minus mu all squared over sigma to the fourth. Okay, so when trying to figure out where the second derivative is positive, negative, where the second derivative actually is zero, things of that nature, we'll need to figure out the zeros of this thing and when this thing is positive or negative. Um, but the thing to notice is that this part is always positive because it's e to some exponent. So the only contributing piece to the negativity and positivity of g happens with this function here. 
So if you want to analyze what happens with the critical points um, and where inflection points are, we need to look at this function here. So I'm going to erase everything and look at this piece only. And I guess I'll call this piece h of x. And whatever happens in terms of the zeros and positive and negative regions of h will govern what happens to the second derivative of g. Okay, so let's make some observations. First of all, we wanted to know whether we not, or not we had a local maximum at x equals mu. If we plug in mu into this h function, this piece right over here disappears. So we're left with negative 1 over sigma squared, which is strictly negative because sigma squared is a positive number. Um, so this implies that mu, we have actually a local max. Okay, that's great. So where are our inflection points? They happen when our second derivative is zero, which we argued is when h of x is zero. So if we try to figure out where h of x is zero, rearranging this, we get x minus mu squared over sigma to the fourth is one over sigma squared. Okay, we well can multiply by sigma squared, and we get that this quantity here is one. So that means that x minus mu over sigma is 1, or x minus mu over sigma is negative 1. If we rearrange this, multiplying by sigma and adding mu, we get x is mu plus sigma. And here, we get x is mu minus sigma. And so this is where our two inflection points happen, right at mu plus sigma and mu minus sigma. Okay, so lastly, if you want to know that mu actually is a global maximum, our function looks something like this. You want to know is there where this uh, point here was mu, not zero. Um, we want to know why our function actually behaves like this. We can check what happens in these intervals right over here, right, that the function actually is um, decreasing in those intervals. Okay, so the derivative of just this piece, which what is what matters in determining non-negativity and positivity of the derivative of f, um, looked like this. Uh, so to end, again, this piece is always um, non-negative. So let's look at this piece to figure out what's going on with the function. So we notice when x is greater than mu, this numerator is positive, and so this entire piece here is positive. With this negative sign, we get a negative. So g prime of x is negative when x is greater than mu. And when x is less than mu, um, we get that the argument right over here is negative. Uh, with this negative, we get a positive, so this entire expression here is positive. So g prime of x is positive when x is less than mu. So this tells us that the function g is increasing before mu and decreasing after mu. So we actually do have a global maximum. Cool, so three interesting facts that we see in a lot of pictures about normal distributions, but that we don't often actually see justifications for, and we can use calculus to address all three of them. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, click the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, definitely subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.